welcome to the February 21 budget work session. Can I get a motion? I make a motion we uh, move into open session. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Anyone reading the closed? Got it. Pursuant to general provisions, Article 3-305, 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, and performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation, and to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I think we are going to start. We're changing it up a little bit with the new course approval with Mr. Tolly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Adam Tolley. I'm the supervisor of career and technical education. And I'm here tonight to ask for approval for two new uh, courses that we will we would want to pilot uh, next school year at Ken Island High School and at Stevensville Middle School. So the first course is uh, Project Lead the Way. They're both Project Lead the Way courses. First one is cybersecurity, which we would run at Ken Island High School. Um, and the second course is Project Lead the Way Computer Science Essentials, which we would run at Stevensville Middle School. It is a high school course that would get the kids, get the students in eighth grade their technology, technology education credit for high school. So it's something that we have uh, been looking at for a long time. And um, the sort of the way it came about, Mr. Uh, Barletta, teacher at Stevensville Middle School, wrote a grant for Project Lead the Way. We got the grant, uh, which was a $10,000 grant. Uh, and we want to see if this is something that is going to work, uh, which is why we're asking for the pilot. Uh, Mr. Barletta, uh, as many of you know, is a, he's a seasoned teacher. He was our Project Lead the Way National Teacher of the Year last year. So uh, we feel very confident. I feel very confident in him to, to test this out. And if this, um, if this works, this is something we would like to do at all the middle schools to run this technology, whether, whether it's this course or another computer science course, but a course that would get the middle school students a high school credit. So this would, they already have the, you know, the option to get um, Spanish credit, um, Algebra 1 credit at the middle school. So this would give them another option uh, to do that. So that's what we're looking for tonight. And I'm assuming since he wrote it down on, down there, that's why it's going to be piloted at Ken Allen High School. But if it's successful, we would then move it to our other middle schools and the Queen Anne's County High School. Correct. That is, that is the plan. Yes. And it, and it fits. It just worked out really well um, with the schedule at Ken Island High School. It works well with Mr. Barletta's schedule. Um, and like I said, we, we're going to keep our options open. But this is the route that we want to go now to see how this works. Um, and then we would want to. There are other options other than Project Lead the Way. So that might not be the, the route that we go in the future at the other middle schools. But uh, there are other courses that you can do at the middle school that would get this high school credit. So, and then, we, but then it'd be offered at Queen Anne's, right. and we would do Steve. I um, mean, sorry, Mattapique, Sundersville, and uh, correct. Sundersville. Yeah, and then those eighth graders would have the chance to get that tech ed credit. So it's just something else that they can, that they can get at middle school, and then they're, um, you know, one credit, one more credit ahead before they get to high school. The uh, cyber security is a year. How long is the? The computer science is that also a year? That's a that's a year long course. And the, the one class, or how are you? Just planning? just one class that would run all year long. Any other questions? Yeah. And motion. Make a motion to uh, approve the uh, approval project for cybersecurity. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Okay. 
Next is the overnight trip approval. Again, we're changing up a little bit for Kenai High School to Bush Gardens. Um, good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Shalins, board members, executive team, for the record. My name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. And next to me, I have... Rihanna Sherman. I'm the choir director at Ken Island High School. And Dan Harding, principal Ken Island High School. We're here before you tonight to um, seek approval for our trip for the Ken Island High School band and choir to travel to Bush Gardens, Virginia, to participate in the music in the parks. Um, they will perform a variety of rehearsed selections and uh, receive ratings from the judges. Uh, Ken Island High School Band and Choir members, um, they will depart on Friday, uh, April 26th, and they will return the next night, uh, April 27th. Um, the travel will be by a charter bus. There's approximately 77 students, um, 12 chaperones. It comes out to about one chaperone every six students. Um, the cost of the trip is, um, what was, was it, five? Per student? Yes. Uh, yeah, 521. And then they also have $100 per student that they've raised through fundraisers, along with the band boosters will <coughs> help uh, with any students that are struggling with financial aid. Is there any questions we'd like to add? Um, there was uh, one other fundraiser that the students were able to do um, that they earned for their own individual student accounts. Uh, their, the prices uh, and the money that was earned varies, but some students have raised over $200 for their trip as well. So they worked really hard on that one. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. You see chaperones just equal number of male, females. I mean, enough, I mean, both. Yes. Yes, one to six. Good, sir. Anything else? All right. <laughs> motion to approve overnight trip for Callum High School, Bush Gardens. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. That's a late pull though, right? All right. Going back to 3.01 FY25 operating budget. Dr. Kibler. So <clears throat> for what Dr. Kibler and I are gonna tag team this a little bit, I'm gonna start off. Um, by just kind of um, talking to the board about the um, landscape that we're in right now as it relates to the perfect storm of our budget for the FY25 um, year. So um, we know that Blueprint is bringing to us many challenges. Um, one of those is that we have to hit that $60,000 threshold of a starting salary. Um, and we have kind of three budget cycles to do that to get there. Uh, so that, that makes, that's right out of the gate very challenging. Um, another thing that's extremely challenging for us is insurance. Uh, $14.6 million of our budget is insurance. That's just over 13%. And we are looking at an increase of six to 8%. Um, so you can see how that's going to inflate that number. And then probably the most significant um, is basically um, just that cliff that we have been talking about and talking about and talking about year after year, right? From the time we got our ESSER funds um, and then we had the LEADS money come out. So when you look at that cliff um, happening, that's quite a number of positions and that will impact us. Um, and you put all of that together and you combine that with declining enrollment and how they calculate um, the wealth calculation um, there's just not money coming to the district as it relates to the state. And so these are really challenging times. We're really at a disadvantage. Um, now our enrollment was up and I wanna make sure that the board understands that our enrollment was up. So one would think that we would get more money from the state because our enrollment's up, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, because of COVID they kept in that three-year rolling average 2019, which is where we were very high in our enrollment. And we're not back to that 2019 mark. So they dropped 2019 out this year. And so with the true um, rolling average, um, although we're 62 students up, we're, we're actually getting funded less than 
um, we did last year, $835,000 less. So um, we know that the commissioners support us and we know that um, at a minimum, they would give us flat funding. We know that publicly in budget meetings that <clears throat> they recognize um, last year, they gave us 6.3 million over. Um, we've, we've heard them say, we understand that $5 million mark, but this year, unfortunately, that $5 million mark above maintenance of effort really is almost a gloom and doom budget for us because of all the factors that I just shared. <laughs> and so we, we put our heads together and um, we said, you know, what, what can we do to kind of show this to everyone so that they better understand? Um, and so tonight we're bringing to you three options um, that we need the board to take a position on, to be honest with you. Um, option A, and Dr. Kibler is gonna go through every single one. Option A is everything that we need to do to keep everything that we currently have in the budget. So all of our ESSER funds, um, positions, all of our leads positions, um, it includes uh, salary enhancement. It also includes your increase in insurance and it, and it also includes the cost of doing business. Um, so that's to, to, to be 100% whole, um, Matt's gonna provide for you uh, draft budget A, which is 18% above last year's. So we're asking for 18% above. 18% from the county. From the county. Yes. Above what the county provided for us last year. The second budget draft is if we were to move forward without, with recognizing that cliff. So if we just took, and he's going to go through every bit of this line item, but just to, to, to get it out there, if we took away and recognize that cliff, what would it look like? That's a 14% above. And then the, the last one presented tonight would be a $5,000 above, which is seven, five million, five million, yeah. excuse me, five million, which is 7%. So um, <coughs> there's a couple of things and Matt's got the slide up for me. A couple of things that I wanted to go through first um, before we kind of move into the, the different scenarios is that it's important also for the board to understand that Sudlersville Elementary School is now designated as a community school. And that's for several reasons. We check all the boxes there. To be a community school, you have to have a certain threshold of free and reduced. You have to um, have access to, like our, our new school-based health center there gets us there. There's several different factors and we, we meet all those factors. And so they're a community school. So that increases our revenue, which is great. Um, but that money has to be designated to go directly to Sutler's Elementary School. So that's $273,000. Um, another thing that is a challenge for us, as I talked about with Blueprint, and Blueprint has great intentions and, and, and we support Blueprint. We do, we support what it stands for and what it's trying to do. Um, great things we've done with pre-K. Pre-K expansion money has been amazing. I mean, it's the right thing for, for our pre-K students to be there all day. We are getting them ready for kindergarten they're going to have a better foundation. And when the board, you know, when the team comes to you and shares the KRA data, you're gonna be like, wow, it's really making a difference. Um, dual enrollment, great. It's awesome opportunity for our students, but the price tag of that, that comes to the district is enormous. Good opportunity for students. We want them to get college credits. We want them to challenge themselves. But when you have a line item that's $120,000 for dual enrollment and it comes in the first semester was $160,000, you're going, oh my, like that's a big ask of the different districts. And those are just some, exam some examples that are putting our budget over where it needs to be. So lots of dynamics, uh, lots on the horizon, um, but just really want to get to that point tonight to where the board can look at these three um, different options and give us direction on which budget you would like us to build out mm -hmm. that we would then take to the commissioners um, and, you know, ask for. Can I, before we get into it, can I ask a question about go back to the health care? Oh, sure. Just because 14.6 million. 14.6 million. And so that's 13% of the budget? Just over so 13. pretty much every million dollars we spend on health care is another percent of our budget. So do we have employees that don't pay any money for health care? Yes, we do. The single individuals have, have the zero, per, they, they contribute zero percent. 
the and board you, pays 100 percent. and you said it's going to increase by six to eight percent correct more? so that's yes. another right yeah six to eight. the compounding factor of that and it has consistently been going up six to eight percent uh, we've been using a little bit of when I say fund balance, I mean reserve for our health care. So there's a different reserve pot for that. So we've been using a little bit of that money. It is very restricted of how much we can take out and when we can take it out. But we have actually been trying to supplement a little bit because the costs have been so high every year. And it's been pre-COVID. I mean, those insurance costs have been, as I said, um, at one point they were almost 10%. So they have come down to between six and eight. Um, but it's it's... It's high, and that's why we brought Everside in. Which is um, no copay, correct. Which is no copay. So we essentially have a, a right good number of employees that um, pay absolutely zero, including no copays if they use Everside. And and but and the way we're set up, the minimum is not 90, we pay 90% of everything. Nobody pays more than 10%. Right? Uh, I would have to go back to that. What I'm saying is Michael, benefit guide. We're paying the majority of all of the health care for our employees. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And What's, you know, you run into a problem yeah. I find mm -hmm. sometimes when you're not invested, you know, and you're getting you don't know really what it's worth. Mm -hmm. And I hope some of them do know what it's worth because when you're paying that number just for health care, I don't think it's sustainable forever. Right. I mean, it's not sustainable if, they, if you want to keep enhancements and keep class sizes and all this other right. stuff. There's a lot of things that go into this thing that uh, I mean, if that was in your own personal budget, you'd be bankrupt. Well, and also three years ago, I think we budgeted 85,000 for every new student, excuse me, every new teacher that came in who was new, every new, is that correct? Right. Now it's about 100, really, because 100, of the benefits are so and great. so when they say we have to get to 60, I think it's a misconception that our, our that these positions are not really making 60,000 because the benefits obviously are making up Much like 40,000. 40, total compensation. You know, and that's tough to hit to keep all of that in and then also hit the 60,000 threshold. So yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. So okay, sorry. That's okay. No, not at all. We, we think the questions are great. Um, so yeah, let's jump into option option A. Dr. Kibble, unless you have, you might ha even have some additional comments. I think that was a great oh. intro <laughs> and. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Kibble. Yeah, great lead up. Um, so, Draft budget A, so we've got the presentation up here. You all have uh, the draft budget summary, which is also posted on board docs. There, there are some extra. So for the public, the draft budget summaries that you all have in front of you are also on board docs. Um, this is basically the first page of the budget book, which kind of summarizes all the changes from one year's budget to the next year's budget. So again, like Dr. Salen said, we're providing three tonight so you can give us direction on how you'd like us to move forward. Draft budget A, just some notes that are associated with it, um, basically allows us to maintain how we're operating in fiscal year 24 into fiscal year 25. One of the things that that means is that includes moving the 30 combined positions that we have between ESSER and LEADS um, into our local budget. So that's that's the first thing with that. That is, like Dr. Salen's mentioned before, that would be a $12.4 billion ask above what the county funded us last year. It also includes, um, if you, on the, on the um, budget summary page, you'll notice there's kind of three, three sections. The first is the revenue, the unrestricted revenue. The second piece is we call the cost of doing business. And these are just annual adjustments that we need to make within our budget. Um, so that's where you'll see um, increasing the line for dual enrollment. And these are increases. So the dual enrollment line of 180,000, it doesn't mean we'd only spend $180,000 on enrollment or dual enrollment, excuse me. It means we would increase that line by $180,000 to get us where we need to be. It's trying to address multiple areas that have been neglected in past year's budgets. One of those would be the athletic line. So adding an additional $60,000 for athletics. And that's what you're seeing there in the, in the cost of doing business section. And then in the proposed additions, these would be the places that are new additions into the operating budget. So that's why you're seeing the grant positions in that section, because we would be pulling them over into the uh, unrestricted operating budget.
Again, the, the, the big idea with option A is allowing us to essentially operate like we are in fiscal year 24 in fiscal year 25. So as we go over to draft budget B, this includes, this is built off of a $9.7 million ask over the county's um, amount last year. So an increase. And I've broken this down into what are the differences from draft budget A to get us to draft budget B when you're looking at the presentation. And essentially what we're doing from A to B is, is kind of the Esser cliff that we've talked about for years now, leads ending, essentially letting that go and not absorbing that back into the local budget. That's, that's part of it. Um, a majority of it, frankly. So what I've removed from A to B is 17 of the total ESSER positions, six of the LEADS grant positions. We included in there in budget A an increase in the textbook line of an additional 278,000. It's just the price of books and materials. Um, so we've taken that back down to just keep it flat from last year to this year. So it would just stay at a half a million dollars instead of increasing it. We reduced scanning costs by $100,000. Part of what this is, is just getting with the times. This building has been around for 100 years. We have documents in this building that are 100 years old to be scanning those, those documents, keeping them electronically and shredding. Part of that is a plan to move to a new building. So we're not storing all of that stuff in the future. And in A, we put that in as a $200,000 cost. This would be to try to spread that out over multiple years. Um, and then I also reduced the materials of instruction line by $3,500. We had to increase, though, the substitute budget by $250,000. And the reason for that is because in removing the 17 ESSER positions, we would be eliminating the permanent subs that are in every building. So if we're going to take the permanent substitutes out, you're going to have to have some additional costs in the um, part-time substitute. So that's kind of that offset. And then this would also include of locally funded positions that we have in fiscal year um, 24, um, approximately 12, eliminating 12 locally funded positions for a savings of about 1.2 million. Part of the reason for that is because if you would go back from A to B, you'll notice I'm not adding up to the total ESSER positions. So that eliminating some of our locally funded positions would allow us to absorb a few of the ESSER positions into our budget. And Dr. Salins, I don't know if you want to point those out or want me to. Sure, well, um, yeah, you, you can see it on here. That, that would be four um, teaching positions that were basically in the ESSERs, um, our English language learner teachers that we added that aligns with our strategic plan um, would have to be pulled in um, to the to the budget, as well as a social worker position that's currently being funded by ESSER, and then two migrant education positions. So those are positions that we can't just eliminate. We, we need to pull them into the operating budget um, to align with our strategic planning and our expectations of the state as it relates to student achievement. So. Question two. So I kind of explained where we how how we got budget A, budget B, and then sort of the, along the same line for draft budget C. This includes that five million dollar increase in county funding from last year, which again Dr. Salins already sort of gave the the lead in on on why we went with this one. Um, and what we're doing now is on this page, the draft budget, the C notes. Think about we're not starting from A this time, so it's going to include everything we've already talked about from B and the following. So now we've removed the athletics increase of $60,000. And again, the increase of $60,000. I know we're going to have the public watching this. 
It's not what's going on in some other districts. This is just the, in, the increase we're taking away, not, not the programs altogether. The commencement increase of $5,000, pulling that back. What it does do, because again, we talked about a doomsday scenario, it's removing the line for textbooks next year altogether, saying we'll take out $500,000 for textbooks. We will not buy any new books next year, which some of the initiatives we've had and we've talked about, we would not necessarily be able to do. Uh, it reduced repairs to buildings. We had built in there an increase of $100,000. So this would, um, I reduced that increase by $35,000. And then the, the last one is, is the hardest to swallow. I will say the 12 that I already talked about in B um, are built into this number. This is um, eliminating 53 locally funded positions for a savings of approximately $5.3 um, million. I would say the 50, that would be 53 total locally funded that we have right now from FY24 into FY25. Uh, what this doesn't talk about is the uh, 23 or 24 we were already mentioning from the grant positions, one that would have already been on top of that 53. So we're at 75, essentially around 75 positions at that point. And then one that we, you know, aren't putting on the table is that flat funding, which is, could happen. And that's $5 million, which would be 50 additional positions. So now you're sitting at 75 with an additional 50 positions if we were just flat funded. So 125 positions. When we say 75 positions, what are, are we talking about across the board, like staff, like everybody? It's just. So the reason we worded it as positions is because, frankly, until we get some guidance, we can't really determine what that would be. Um, and, and it would be across the board. It would be all, all areas of the organization. Right. So obviously 12 month employees are administrators that work 12 month employees make more money than, say, a certified teacher. Um, that makes more money than, say, a support staff person. So we do gauge it by what the average cost of that is, and that's how we determine we get that $100, I mean, $100,000 mark. Um, but again, if it's an administrator, it might be higher because they work 12 months. If it's a support staff, it might be a little less than that. So, so, that, so the, make, the, the real idea there is to find $5.3 million of salary savings in this. Realistically, when with Dr. Sale and the executive team, we go through this, work with other administrators in the district. 53 could be uh, a little bit lower depending on, on what positions. Exactly, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Or a, a tad higher. The, the idea is that 5.3, and we use the average, just a placeholder of what salary and benefits would be. So really, at this point, <clears throat> when you're looking at such a deficit in your budget, you can do three things. You can either cut programs, you can um, cut staff members or you can um, not give a salary enhancement. Those are the only three options. And so, or maybe a, a combination of those three and it, you know, gets you where you need to go. But the bottom line is you have to do some kind of cut because you have to be able to um, look at that cost of doing business when you have no choice, um, you know, with gas prices or electric bills and things like that. I mean, you have to cut something. So those are your only three options. I personally, um, at this point, I, I would not like to entertain um, program changes for students because I think that what we offer for students is really great opportunities. And I think our students do very well. And you see that in our test scores. Um, and, and cutting staff is going to hurt. I mean, you're going to see class sizes. They're going to go up. You have no choice but to do that. But personally, I'd rather see a class size go up than start cutting programs down. Mm -hmm. um, right? I mean, that's just my opinion. I, I think that's, but it's 75, a reality. 75 positions, what's that, 10% of our total workforce? Just over. And you mentioned, I thought I heard you mentioned 125 number. What? Right, because if you take your ESSER and then you take um, the- 75. I mean, the ESSER. Not 125 positions. Right, but okay. then if you add, if we didn't get $5 million, Oh, if we got be, the flat, yes. If we got flat funding, then that would be $5 million, which essentially is about 50 staff. Okay. About 50 positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's about 10 positions for every million dollars. Mm. Thanks. 
Well, well, I don't mind. Go ahead. You know, it's a superintendent's job to present a budget that you feel keeps us whole. Is it realistic? It's it's real, but is it realistic that it's obtainable? I don't. I can't say that. Mm -hmm. um, this board, I think, has to make a decision on what's realistic. I mean, we're up here what presenting a budget for our students, but also we have taxpayers. And you know, when I look here, the state's paying two point four percent increase. Putting all these, now, I can complain mm -hmm. about this. It's not going to go anywhere. But then when you start asking the county for mm -hmm. five and six and ten percent increases, mm -hmm. it's not sustainable. So I mean, we got to draw a line, and it's not going to be. I mean, my personal opinion, the first one A is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, then we need to discuss B and C, right. and even at C, you're still talking five million dollars over what's makes effort is. Now, I know cost of business costs more, mm -hmm. but you know, so it's, you know it, it's more than that because it's actually 5.835 above maintenance. Right, because you got to eat the, they, they, got, they they have the decrease. But, of, I, but, yeah, the, right. but the county mm -hmm. citizens and the commissioners have been good to us. They have been and they, and they've very done good a, to they've us. They've done really good in the last, more than I've ever seen in the last couple of years. I've been in this position. You know, it's just tough to swallow this and think some people think they're not, it's, it's almost embarrassing to ask for some of this stuff to me. I mean, I know it's there, and I'm not saying criticizing you. It's real. It is real. But you know, we we've done a lot with Esser and Leeds grants. It's helped us out and got our numbers good. But it's over with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The party's over. Yeah. We got to got to go back to reality. Yeah. And when you talk uh, insurance and stuff like that, I mean, I'm not saying you're not getting it. It's like getting a speeding ticket. You got nothing for it. Yeah. You're just it's just a cost to cost more to do it, and you just got it. And I just. It, it's not it, it's <clears throat> September the first, like we've said. We're gonna open schools no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. So we just gotta find out what's the best. It might look a little different. I agree it, with they're you. gonna look different. Right. I but, but you're right. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. We're gonna continue to serve students. Right. Yeah, and I'm kind of and along with Dick as I you're right. I mean, we knew that Leeds and Esther was gonna go. Right. I, so I don't I'm not comfortable with A, like you said, I I wouldn't be comfortable with it personally. Because we knew they were gonna go away. Um that, just how it is and so somewhere between yeah the B and C and definitely don't want to cut any programming but it's you're right to just go on I can you don't say want stuff to cut about, programming and you don't want to cut staff but if you need more money mm -hmm. for enhancements you need right. more money for uh, main, uh, health care you need electrics going up every, I mean we know that in our own home yeah, budget exactly. so let's mm -hmm. face it you know uh, I can't imagine what the electric went up this time <laughs> I mean it's all you know it's just things to think and the main part, and like you said, when we start talking 100000 per person, that's where our money is. It's staffing. It's staff. 86 percent of our budget is staff, and every time we can have somebody not employed, it's, it saves us $100,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, the, yeah. So. I was just going to say, you know, uh, B, I, 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 you know, through <coughs> attrition is how I think we could resolve that. When you get to see it does make it that much more challenging because then you are starting to say, okay, well, you know, who on this staff can we, we're going to have to riff, you're going to have to start doing riffs. And that that's where the struggle really comes. But if, if we keep it at that, that, you know, plan B is, is something that, you know, it's like the 10% that we can do through attrition, that we have people who retire, people who move to a different district because they're you know, um, spouses in the military, yeah. whatever. whatever the but reason. we do have that this consistent number of teachers, about 60 that we hire every year. And so, you know, that seems doable. We can do that without kind of really impacting us as a whole. Um, but even B is 14%. I know. Right. B is 14%. It's 14%. You know? You're right. And we all live in this county, too. Correct. Yes. Mm hmm Yep. It's, it's a struggle right now. Um, and and not that it necessarily makes a difference, but we're not sitting alone. We have a lot of counties that are in the exact same boat that we are. Um, and the the blueprint, as I said, that has amazing intentions and is it good for kids? Yes, but it's not funded. And until the state realizes that we're going to have districts that are essentially, uh, I, I'm not saying our district is going to do this, but some districts are going to go bankrupt. I mean, literally. Right. And is that good them. for kids? I mean, <laughs> yeah. cutting right. teachers, cutting their programs, that doesn't, yeah. that seems like the opposite of what they're intended to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So and you can't cut special ed. No, no you cannot. Federal mandates. Right. 
maybe something between B and C. I definitely don't want to cut anything budget off of SIDS. He's already bare bones. Bare bones. I think so. what we need to do is present some kind of budget or have Dr. Sellins work on a detailed budget because whatever we pick, B or C, or none of the above. And we should ask completely if different direction. out A. Uh, and A's on the thing, but I, I don't we Well, we didn't, but there was still. Yeah, there's still a lot of people might want. We still might have to sit there and curtail some stuff out of here. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, anything over maintenance of effort is an increase. Mm -hmm. Correct. And when, when you take um, C, that's seven and a quarter percent. Well, most budgets in this damn world doesn't go up seven and a quarter percent. No. Nope. And if we're going to sit there, and that's C, mm -hmm. and that's still more than a lot more maintenance of effort spend, more than they've ever given us before. So, I mean, we've got to be, got to be realistic. And we can't wait for the state to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot. And Matt, you got to present a fleshed out budget, right? Or we do by March. The budget, the budget calendar that, that you all approved <clears throat> says that you would vote on it on March 6th. That doesn't mean you can't change can't, it. Right. But we, we do have to work with the county too with their, with their deadline. So I, I would assume that we could push March 6th a little bit, but I, I, we do not know right now what that could be. We do have a meeting with the county administrator next Wednesday on the books, so we might get be able to nail that timeline down more. But if we give you a figure tonight, you can work with that, right? Whether it's March 6th, we make it or we postpone it. Sure. Maybe you know. So are we actually going to take a vote on this or is it a discussion? I, I, think, we we should, I think we should give direction on which way they should go because. Right. Well, there's five of us. We can give five different directions if we can <laughs> come to a consensus is my point. I, I oh, will do we want say. To look, a, B, and C? I'm sorry. I don't mean to. That's okay. Go ahead. La, la, the past two years, looking back at the, the board meeting documents, because again, I'm, I'm in an interim role. So, so what we've done the past few years is you basically at that March meeting voted on a budget summary and then the, the details of where every individual dollar figure out went from there. Because like right now, there's 12 locally funded positions, like Ms. Capes, you ask, like, what are those positions necessarily? So we, we would have to, if we're gonna present a, a full budget book, we need to, because of the state's requirements, the different categories, we have to identify what those positions are. If we do, if we do more than just voting on a um, summary at the March 6th. But again, that's what you've done the last, to so narrow this down for discussion. Mm -hmm. Personally, I say we do not entertain budget A. Correct. I agree. I agree, I agree on that. One hundred percent. All right. I'll let you learn the next. Right. Well, and then I don't want to entertain any stuff. Program cutting. Personally, I mean, like you said, I think we have a fantastic programs in in, in Queen Anne. So, like you said, it might just have to be bigger classes. Um, so somewhere, I'm, I'm kind of leaning somewhere between B and, I mean, C is, while wow, cutting all those positions is, but instead of 7 or 14, maybe a 10%. Um, well, you, you know, we're, we're going to present a budget. And mm -hmm. it's, Dr. Sellers is, is obligated to present a budget that's going to keep us whole. Mm -hmm. This board does something that's probably going to be higher than what the commissioner's going to think is, is, is available. Because, it's, you know, they got, they got five other, mm -hmm. or probably 10 other parts. I don't know what they got that need money. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you got to tell the sheriff we're going to cut deputies. You're going to tell EMS we're going to be go from an eight minute to a 15 minute response time. Right. I mean, so we're, we're picking out what we're going to present and take to the commissioners, whether they fund it or not, still, it's totally back to listen. not in mm -hmm. our control. When it comes back, we know what we've got, if anything. Mm -hmm. And then we know from there where we can cut from right. attrition or whatever we need to do. Class size increases, hopefully not program cuts. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you were leaning between a B and a C. And a C, yes. B and a C. Between a B and a C. You got a figure in your head? I was thinking, well, then I was thinking, what was the other one? Was it eight, 9.8 million? Say again? 8 million. Oh, 9.8 or 8? Eight? 8. Eight. Because okay. right. 12 is 9.7 yeah. or other no, one, right. yeah. So okay. 8 well, million. Let me make a suggestion. We've got mm -hmm. three in front of us. One we put on the side burner or act the door. <laughs> They've worked up B and C. We decide which one, and they might still have to work it on it again, no matter which one we do. We could pick C, and we could still be working on it. Yeah, right. So I think we need to do that, be up front, we'll have some discussions, and then, and it, like, 
when it when it comes down, we're going to get X number of dollars. They're going to, I think, they'll be fair to us. But when they, but, but they can only do what they got, and mm -hmm. then when that happens, we then decide we don't want to cut programs. We want to, keep, you know, but we're going to have to have class size increase a little bit. Right. It is what it is. It, it's 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 the you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do so you think? Matt, are you thinking B or are you thinking a number? I say we should. I personally think we should. I, I'm not thinking B, but I, but I could understand pass and B, and then sit there and see what happens. Well, I'm fine with B, too. You guys drafted up three plans. I don't think we need to go in, right. picking in between. Yeah. Uh, there was obviously a reason you came up with 9.7 million, mm -hmm. uh, and what, 14% in that case. Um, oh. Sounds like Dick's on board with B. I'm fine with B. I'm not, I'm I, I, I think we're gonna have to make cuts on B, but, right. but, well, but that's, that's, that's where we're gonna start this, as a again, proposal. Is, but that's you know. what we should say. Right, so we're that how, do I have a motion then on the table? Are we voting? Or we just wanted to move forward with B. We have a consensus that the board yeah, thinks consensus. B would be well, something we move forward with. I think we have a consensus right. to start with B. Nope. Nope. All right. All right. B it is. Thank you. So, it, so in general, March 6th, we will bring B just in that form, just right. one sheet. Yep. Okay. Back and then build it out from there. And maybe, yeah. like Dr. Gibbler said, we will have met. You know, yeah, and hopefully they will get some direction on on what they're thinking. Okay, and, and, some, and, uh, and, and during the whole time, I think we need to keep looking underlying. You know, I know you, this is a, a ten thousand view. Get down to yeah. five thousand, two thousand, yeah. one thousand. When we get right down to a, a harder figure, but you know, they've got to have budget hearings. Mm -hmm. they, so no, yeah. they, they're not going to be their thing probably maybe until May because they got to hear everybody and their, yeah. their uh, department. So it's a, it's a process. I think right. we need to put something in. And then we need to have our budget to the state. What's the deadline for? I, I have to get back to you on that. Ahead. Further on, all right. We'll have it. We'll have it after the commissioners give us the money we know the commissioner. Yeah, no, I, just I understand that, right? Yeah. It's a very tight. For approval. From when the from when we get it from the commissioners to get it to the state, it's very tight. Well, I think that's where we have yeah. open discussion, and you you'll have some plans yeah. to get us where we need to be. Yeah. And I guarantee you, we'll be September. To, might not look like this, but we'll be here. Like the same. Yeah, we'll all be here. On this slide where you have the 1.2 million, is that salary and benefits? Is that included in yes. that number? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is this uh, exponential uh, the next year? It is exponential. Yes. 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 Cost of doing business mm -hmm. is, is, is a real thing. <laughs> Excited. I, I released. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Questions? Thank no, you, Dr. Kibler. Thanks, Dr. Kibler. Yes, you're released. <laughs> it's a good choice of dismissed. <laughs> you can go. Not too far. Yeah, all right. Um, so the cursive writing uh, has came up, and, and we've had discussions about this before. So, Alexis, I know you initially had brought it up. Um, my computer stopped working so yeah i would like to make a motion that we um bring the cursive writing back into the curriculum i'll second that do we have any discussion we just my mm -hmm. we do have because we've been updated on this in the past mm -hmm. we do have that in some of our schools mm -hmm. now so it's not like we don't have it but you're, what we're looking at is making it more standard and i think it's what two or three second and third grades when it happens? Yeah. That's exactly right. Second grade is where it's formalized and it's typically taught. That's where the standards say it. And then the other grades, the upper grades in elementary school, if technology is not available, then cursive writing. So I guess my only question- Do we have the ability to, do two things. Do we have the ability to do, I guess we do because we have teachers, but do we have the space and time to do it if we, at, at whatever level, you know, we feel comfortable. You guys feel comfortable with that. That would be difficult. Uh, we we would have to figure out where we would pull that instructional time. Right now, what's happening is that s during our small group rotations, there are sometimes set aside times in classrooms where students can practice cursive writing. Okay, but if we were to actually implement cursive writing, we would have to figure out where that time is coming from. Is it going to come from whole group instruction? It's going to come from small group instruction. Where are we pulling that time? And so um, I know that we have a survey that we have drafted that we're planning to send that survey out to get some input from families. Because at this point, I mean, I've been sitting in this seat for almost two years now, and no one has contacted me specifically about cursive writing. 
I haven't seen an email or a phone call. And typically, if there's something going on instructionally, I will get a phone call or get notified. And I have not to date. I was saying, did we get any phone calls about the two classes we just approved? I mean, I've heard it from teachers, like, mm -hmm. you know, in the classroom that, like you said, are if they have a little bit of instructional time, but, oh, did you need me? Oh. Yeah, no, they were oh. saying goodbye. <laughs> that are teaching it. But the question I had is you said um, it's being done at some schools and not others. What, like how is, why is that happening? Well, it depends on what the schedules are looking like. I mean, it depends on the school time and the instructional day, what's happening specifically. Um, there is a lot that's going on during the, if you look at the English language arts block, especially at the elementary level, uh, most of the time our teachers have three. If they're lucky, they have three small groups that they have to instruct. Sometimes it's four small groups. They also have to focus on in early in the early grades phonemic awareness, specifically phonological awareness, informational text. They're doing all of these different pieces that are happening within the English language arts block. A lot's happening. Vocabulary, all of these pieces take, you know, it's important. So we've got to take a look specifically at where we can pull that instructional time. And we want to take a look at that to see if we can balance that with all the other things that are happening within the instructional time within our EL block. But some teachers are doing it. Yes. So somewhere they can be done. Right. Matt, you raise yes. your hand. Yeah. I, I just wanted to offer on the one point about the question that we run the courses by the public. Uh, the courses themselves, not necessarily, but the strategic planning process two years ago what we heard from all stakeholder groups teachers parents community members students we would love a financial planning class, class. yeah why are we not learning to balance a checkbook what's credit card debt mean mm -hmm. so i mean that that is a response and we, we did run those courses through the cac and the ssic as well so i mean that that could be an, an avenue as and that's well that's why i wanted more information that's why i um, asked for the survey um, because i haven't heard it as Matt said, through the strategic plan, it never came up, not one time. And so, you know, but in my student groups, every time I meet with student groups, um, which is at the secondary level only, con constant financial literacy, increasing the science opportunities, AP classes, you know, those types of things. I, I don't I don't hear anything from from even students that say, I really wish I had had cursive handwriting. Would you consider putting that back in the curriculum? I mean, I'm fine with it if we can find the space and the availability, but something's gonna have to be cut. And our, our you know, you ask about how it's different from school to school, that's an excellent question because um, believe it or not, the instructional day, even though the instructional day is the same at each of our elementary schools, um, how much time they have with their teacher is different. And you're like, well, how does that actually happen? Well, because Kennard and Centerville Elementary Schools, buses are situated the way they are, they're, they're taking in kids for 20, 25, minutes in the morning and then dismissals 20 25 minutes in the afternoon but when you go to church hill it's completely different all the students come off they go right to their teacher so they actually lose time at some of our schools it's just not equal across the board and that's simply because of transportation and how our students are um, you know if we had more buses we probably could resolve that issue but it would take a lot more buses and a lot more money um, when do they start using chromebooks they they actually use the technology piece of it down to pre-k level believe it or not but we don't what do you mean the technology oh not the, the chromebooks for we we were in our budget um for kindergarten which got cut from our budget last year um so they actually have carts and they share so like four four teachers are on a team and i might have it from 9 to 10 30 and then you know the next teacher has it during the day or whatever but we don't have designated but for a first grade they uh, they have them available to them. And how long does it take to get a, a grade schooler <clears throat> proficient in uh, in cursive? Well, that's a really good question because every student works at their own pace, and yeah, some right, right. actually, it, it, you know, developmentally speaking, some students are more advanced, and so you are kind of all over the board with that. Um, it, you know, is there an average? I mean, for your average student, I mean, typically you only get that instruction for one year, and then you have opportunities to practice it in the curriculum the rest of the time. Right, right, so right. you know that, that instructional time, and and what would that instructional time look like? Is I think what Dr. Sprankle was going going to. I mean, are we you know moving to purchase a handwriting curriculum for our students and implement that at a certain you know extensive of. I'm just pulling something out 15 minutes a day. 
um, or are we looking to put it in in a variety of ways where they do have different stations where the student would practice that at a different station. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to go about it, but I kind of wanted to get information so the board could make a good decision on it. Um, do we, you know, if the board gets the information, they say, look, I don't know that it needs to be, you know, 15 minutes every single day, but it certainly needs to be in the curriculum. Can we make sure that in every single classroom they have that as a station and that those students get exposed to that three times a week or, or whatever? Um, but, I, you know, I just don't feel like I have the um, knowledge right now enough to say, I know what the need is there because I haven't, I don't have any information that can guide me on that. But if the board says today we're going to vote on it and you're putting handwriting back in there, we're going to figure it out. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we're going to figure it out, right? So why, does anybody know the history why Queen Anne's County pulled handwriting or we was that an actual before. conscious decision or did it just kind of I think it buys well away? I don't think it was the, just it the county. It's it's the, the techno county. Go with technology. With technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My rebuttal to that is, we have kids on Chromebooks all day and we don't teach them to type. We have, my daughter's in fifth grade and she's writing an essay on the computer and has no clue how to type. She's hunting and pecking. Why isn't she have a, a pen and paper, a pencil and paper, writing her essay down? Like easier to convey your thoughts. I mean, we're not teaching these kids to type or we want to go the technology route, but we're not providing those those skills. And we teach them to print, right? Print, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And, Which uh, it takes so long. What? Which it just takes so long. You know, to print when you're punching. Well, it's a slow, yeah. it's a slow speed yeah. method well, of getting your ID even, on paper. And yeah. I, I, as a Boy Scout leader, I brought this up before. I've seen my Boy Scouts; their mind is running 100 miles an hour, and they're trying to write down something, and they, they're stuck with printing, and it, it looks like a foreign language, language. you know, like yeah. uh, <laughs> Chinese hieroglyphics or whatever. But yeah. well, it was well, it wasn't even just the idea of cursive either. It was the type of the fine the motor brain, skills yeah, and the brain, the brain to, connection that helps them learn. Right. That. So and even if I you asked them if they needed cursive, they wouldn't know that they needed it because they're not familiar with what happens in their brain when they're learning it. And I know we, uh, some of us have done some research on it and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, there is a certain artistic expression that comes with it um, as mm -hmm. the kids develop their own method of you know cursive. Um, okay. I know that California, the whole state board just returned to cursive writing in the curriculum because they, they realized that they made a mistake the one with Common Core 10 years ago, whatever it was, and pulling it out. Um, you know, if California jumped off a bridge, would I jump off a bridge? I don't know. My mom would advise against it. But I think there is a need to put cursive back into the, the curriculum, which obviously is why I seconded the motion. And when we think about that, though, we still have to think about the conversation we just had about the budget and what comes out so that we can sure. purchase the equipment or the materials and the time to get that done. So there's going to be a balance. Yeah, I didn't course. have any when I learned to write cursive. I didn't have any equipment. No, so I, I, I had a pen and a paper and you watched your teacher draw it and you You'd, the paper had dotted yeah. lines on it, right? Yes. Solid, but you had some equipment. Yeah, yeah. so we didn't have any pencil and dotted lines. Yeah. Yeah. Sure that sure that would even have to come to us for the budget items because you can buy those pads of paper for less than yes. $5,000. Yeah. 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 I could donate a couple. And right. uh, so if we were to bring it back in, it would be at the grade school level, right? The kids that are in eighth grade now that, that missed it through Common Core, ninth grade, um, we wouldn't be going back retroactively, right? They're old enough now they, they can that do that on their own if they're that interested yeah. Yeah. Um, or if their parents are. So it would be the second grade, which is what? Second or third. I would say second or third. I, I'd rather default to Bridget and where it is, where, yeah. we, where okay. we can put it in the Somewhere curriculum. In there. Because because it's appropriate at both of those. Yeah, and I wouldn't attempt yeah. here. My, my right. point was how many students are we talking about in a first year reintroducing cursive, what, 700 students in those Not second even. or third grade? Yeah, no. Oh, like second, that. if you did both of those, right, it. exactly. But we probably would do one or the other. Yeah, one or the other. So yeah. 700 students, something like that, or less. Less, that, less. Yeah. Is it? All right. Just to get a rough idea. But I think it's, even though I talk to people and say, why do we need that anymore? I think we do. I think it's a, a skill that's lost that shouldn't be lost. Uh, I, my question is, I have no problem in going for it. I just want to understand because every time you have a five gallon bucket and you put another <laughs> quart in it, it's probably well worth something else coming out. I'm not sorry, but I think we just need to, I'd love to get it in for next September, you know, if we can, uh, 
but I'd like to make sure we do it the right way and, and, and that, that, that doesn't upset the apple cart any farther. You know, that would be my, my suggestion to the, to the So state. are we putting out the survey or not? Yeah, well, it's ready so to go for we, March, well, but I mean, why do we need the survey if I mean, I'm trying to think if we've done have we done surveys for other classes? Well, it's like like for these two classes, did a survey go out to see if we wanted these two classes? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, no, but, but did a, no, he talked about that he'd heard from parents. But did we do an official survey like we're sounds like we're doing here for any of the curriculum that we that we're doing? Did we do a survey when we took it out? Right. I mean, yeah. it's just I'm wondering if we pass, if we vote and if that. it were to pass, we wouldn't need a survey. I mean, what would be the point? Because well, I think it's how you implement it. Correct. Oh, right. Well, that's a whole nother issue, but that's I would just say out. you started. I think we started a precedent this year with the new courses, taking them to the CAC and the SSIC mm -hmm. for input before you yeah. voted on them. Mm -hmm. So you so you knew what they thought of. So did we do a survey on those courses? The answer is no, but they were presented to those groups before they so CAC saw these mm -hmm. did I miss that meeting yeah, they... did they see this before <laughs> I'm just wondering because I just I, I've been to the I've been very diligent going to those meetings the finance I mean the financial algebra the um uh, it might need the the you know what I think you're right they did not see those but they right. definitely saw the financial yeah. algebra because I was at that meeting myself. and the, the mm -hmm. additional yeah. arts theater courses yeah, there is. Yeah. So I guess I'm saying it doesn't have to be. It's not our precedent because they didn't go to these two. I mean, we've done it, but it's. So I'm comfortable with proceeding on a vote, whether it's tonight or another night, but without a survey. Um, now, Dick made a point when you put something in, something yeah. might have to come out. Um, I'm not going to make a motion to postpone the vote right now. If somebody wants to do that, that's fine. Um, but it would be good to know, you know, what exactly what time is going to be or what program or not program, but activities, whatever you want to call it. Second sure. Grade, I can, uh, I can certainly have, I mean, out. it's going to come through, um, Angela Hebert and, and Bridget Passon. The two of them will work together to, um, determine whether second grade, third grade, what's the best fit. Um, and then look at the materials and what, what we would either need to purchase and, and what we would need to change. I mean, that those recommendations are going to come from them because I really consider them the experts. Mm -hmm. Um, of so they would make a recommendation right. um, and, and kind of talk through it with us. And then I can certainly have them present to the board with the final where it's going, what's it going to look like type of, you know. Well, if we voted activity. tonight to put cursive back into our thing, mm -hmm. you're going to come back with how it's going to look and what's yeah, going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, the I board can. could then make a motion. Is it still reasonable or not? Or let's move forward with it. But right now, I think the board is kind of saying we'd like to see cursive. Let's, let's let's go. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of saying. I don't want to come back and see if it's going to go. It's just we, well, we got to find out what. You know, well, right, but yeah. we can vote they on it tonight. Then we can figure that because out. I feel like every time we just we make a decision, you guys work it all make together, it make it happen. Um, so I'm totally comfortable if that's something that we're going to that we do. That you make it happen in a reasonable way that that looks good for the best interest of the system. Yeah. Well, if if also they come back and say we're going to drop this, this, and this, and it's going to cost, I don't think it's going to cost that much money, yeah. but, you know, then we sit there and say, hey. Yeah, uh -huh. but we don't have all of that. Like, we don't know, we don't always have all those things for all the changes that, that are made. We don't know all the different financial pieces. I don't know enough about what impact. I, I personally mm -hmm. like cursive. I don't know what impact that talks about. And it's going to come back and sit there and say, okay. you know, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'll, I'd have no problem voting on it and personally letting it go forward. It's just, you know, Okay. I know we got a motion in a second. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. So I, I did want to add one more point, though, that um, when looking at the courses that come through and where they go and everything, um, if it's an elective course, you know, we look at that a little bit differently because not everybody's required to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, but when it's a requirement, yeah, it, we typically try to get additional information. And this will be a requirement for all students. Mm -hmm. So I just want to differentiate that, that, you know, I was trying to think, why would we not have brought that to them? And when sure. it's in, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So if it's something that, the financial yeah. literacy class wasn't. Well, wasn't but, but we did it on purpose because, because we the, want to move to make it a requirement, if you correct. recall. And so that's why we purposefully planted that seed to see what kind of reaction did we get? What are parents thinking? Right. Um, but, you know, you made me really think. So yeah. I was just like, OK, I got it now. Sorry. Um, but yes, so this would be a requirement for everyone. Okay. And that that's that's the only difference between that and having, you know, the elective classes right. type of opportunity. 
right. Anything else? All right, we have a motion and a second. All I'm in just favor? Thinking, well, just one other thing. You said Ms. Giebert will be looking at it. Yeah, Angela Gieber and Bridget Passon would together work to determine where it would go and what, what would it look like. So they would probably get input from an OT. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Good point. Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All of everybody. Okay. Aye. Sure. <laughs> what she was said, it? Sure. She said unanimous. Was it oh, unanimous? Oh, sorry. Yes. I, I didn't hear you. I apologize. No, you're good. All right, Human Resources Report. Can I get a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the Human Resources Report. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Future meetings. We have February 28th as a budget work session at 4.30, and then March 6th will be our regular board meeting. Um, is that going to work for everyone? What was, the, what was that date again? The 28th? February 28th for the okay. budget work session at 4.30. We meet with the... Um, oh, they're meeting with the... The, the county that the, day. The 28th. The, the next... The 28th. Oh, we're doing session will be the capital. I mean, capital. Never mind. Sorry. I was thinking, oh, we'll have an update for you. But we will probably have an update for you, but it's for capital. So, okay. okay. All right. We're so good. we're still Thank good you. for that one. Okay. And then March 6th for the board meeting. Yes. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.